Welcome to Edu Ask. In this video, we are going to see three international case studies explaining eco design concepts applied over cities. And at the end of the video, we will explain you the role of eco design in cities and suburbs. The most common problem in urban centers is lack of livable spaces. These spaces are largely affected by urbanization, globalization, and industrialization. As we all knew, urbanization is people migrating from rural to urban areas in a large number for employment. This creates a demand in housing and infrastructure. That way, it fails existing urban growth model. And about globalization, it almost destroys our own identity. Applying other countries' successful model to ours without concerning our emotions and culture, it will fail again. And about industrialization, though it gives employment opportunity, the most of the agricultural lands are grab for industrial development. Even they encroach reserve forests and swampland for industries. So now, eco design, it is the only solution which will balance the built and natural environment and protect ourselves from urbanization, globalization and industrialization. The city concept discussed over the past 20 years were future cities and smart cities. But what actually needed is livable cities. Livable cities are eco-friendly design cities. Eco design, it is an approach to design with a special considerations for environmental impacts. It is about integrating planning, urban design and conservation of natural systems to produce a sustainable built and natural environment. Applying these principles in urban planning and designing transforms urban development into desirable, lower carbon and walkable communities. The factors that influences eco-designs are natural resources, Achieving sustainability through natural resources, protecting green spaces and make them interactive with man-made environment and about quality of life, it is an expectation of an individual or society for a livable environment. The factors which pulls down the eco-designs are growing population, rising sea level and climate change. Growing population demands more space to live in and required large infrastructures and employment opportunities. Urban heat island, CO2 emissions from industries are the major concern for rising sea level and climate change. This will impact the natural resources. Let's get into our case studies. Vancouver, a seaport in British Columbia, is Canada's densest, most ethnically diverse cities surrounded by mountains. This Google image shows landscape pattern of Vancouver crisscrossed by rivers. It requires large investments in infrastructure since the inner city sits on a large peninsula. In the early 1990s, they come up with an idea called Vancouverism. A new investment idea turned into action and whole inner city was quickly transformed. The concept of Vancouverism combines respect for nature with dynamic urban street life. You can see large residential population living in city center with mixed use development, typically with a medium height, commercial base and a narrow high-rise residential towers. Replacing rail yards and warehouses with new development spaces, this transformation is an example of eco-design in action. This neighborhood view shows slim residential towers on townhouse podiums with a open views along the waterfront park. The park and housing sites were reclaimed from a redundant rail yard. This new neighborhood is Typical of what has become known as Vancouverism, urban density, but also great amenities. Tall towers are constructed to be thin and well separated. Managing and massing spacing of towers is a key requirement for making a high density more comfortable. In this image, you can see the base tower integrated with a podium that will cut the impact of tower scale on pedestrians. Here you can see the landscape courtyards within group of apartment towers offers a privacy and a safe place for children to play. In a residential blocks, courtyards are on raised level above parking and street front shops. Residents using this rooftop leftover spaces as roof gardens. The places are with parks, benches, pedestrians and protected bikeways. Even the jobs, housing, recreation, day-to-day -day activities are very close together. In this image, you can see the neighborhood party organized by nearby residences. They are living comfortable in 
dense, mixed use and walkable communities. This image shows the protected walkways and bikeways. In inner city, all different type of households sits with a context of connected paths with priority for walking and cycling with a good transit access. Here in this walkway and bikeway was developed from another absolute rail yard. Model choice is priority for any sustainable city. As you see here, Vancouver is increasingly balancing the availability of car with the walking, cycling and transit. Over 60% of the trips are made by non-motorized modes. Mostly people walking but also bicycling and even using skates. Most other trips are on transit including local bus system and rapid transit for longer trips. A cutting edge new standard for advanced systems for managing energies were provided in cities. In Vancouver's growth model, there is a big emphasis on amenity, attractive architecture and landscapes. Walking, cycling and skating have become natural way to move around and bring exercises into everyday activity. Almost all cost of this commonwealth amenities is secured from new projects as developer contribution and almost no capital funds need to be drawn from tax or public borrowing. A double row of trees along sidewalk offers visual barriers to adjacent tall buildings and creates a sense of protection from cars on street. This photo shows a normal Vancouver sidewalk that results from this planting requirement. This street works perfectly in a residential setting, calming traffic, offering valuable parking and giving all the accesses that is needed. Shoreline It has been constructed to regenerate marine life and offer recreation and discovery. Local landscape supports these urban wildlife. Fronting buildings along the walkway and bikeway offers a strong direct relationship between living and public use as well unforgettable images of Vancouver. This image shows prime agricultural land is protected throughout the region. Though there is a huge demand of land parcels, the development bylaws make sure that agricultural lands are protected. The city government has taken the leadership role and facilitated a widely supported vision and the whole place is comprehensively planned. Hundreds of thousands of people were involved in designing the overall plan of Vancouver's inner city. Now, Vancouver, despite its many successes, still falls short of what we need for comprehensive eco-design. Though partial successes, Vancouver has made a commendable start and it is a good place for the reference. Now we we'll move on to the next case study. Helsinki, Finland. Helsinki, capital of Finland, one of fastest growing cities in Europe. The city's 2050 plan is to accommodate future growth without urbanizing any more land. Instead, growth will fill in underused areas around the multiple new centers of development, supported by extended transit network. Helsinki pursued a policy of decentralization into surrounding communities with the development of apartment buildings in the suburbs. This image shows the historic center of the city built around the original arbor with Lutheran Cathedral, one of the city's most prominent landmarks visible in the center of the photo. Helsinki is mainly a low-rise city with the development dominated by blocks of apartment buildings that grew up along the streetcar lines. And this image shows internationally famous Tapiola Garden City in suburb. Tapiola was largely constructed in 1950 and 1960s by Finnish Housing Foundation and was designed as a garden city. The various parts of Tapiola are connected by extensive park zones. Like many European cities, Helsinki pursued a policy of decentralization with development of apartment buildings in the forest like community Filajamaki which dates from mid-1960. It is reached by a bus from the highway system. Helsinki built an extensive highway system with two ring roads and many radials which facilitated this decentralization. In 2008, city moved the loading and unloading of container shipping from the outmoded dock to a new location. This almost freed the 250 hectares of prime waterland for redevelopment. 
This image shows 250 hectares of prime waterfront, develop, waterfront redevelopment. And this image shows a mixed use rural thick district in Helsinki, Finland. The apartment buildings are facing the inland and prominent in the foreground. You can see a high tech research center in the background with a shopping, housing and offices closer by. Helsinki growth model accommodate new population within the existing urbanized area by identifying the unused lands within the city. So our next case study, Portland, United States. Portland follows the inner city revitalization strategy. Portland's core city is now competitive with its suburb. It is more and more sustainable, becoming part of story of what is popularly called Portlandia. The inner city of Portland, Oregon is an example of eco-design, thoughtfully applied to achieve urban revitalization. The Portland streetcar shown here offers balanced to transportation system so that people do not need to use the cars. From 1986 onwards, the Metropolitan Area Express called MAX was expanded to become a four-lane grid of light rail transit connecting the downtown to suburban centers. The public tax money was poured into a balanced transportation system. The Portland Streetcar, the downtown distributor for region's light rail system. Light rail system, it is a form of urban rail, public transportation that generally has a lower capacity and lower speed than a heavy rail and metro systems. Portland has most elegant and pervasive street Scaping, focusing on landscaping and artscaping and creating a comfortable walkable spaces. Along with the transit, cycling routes were also created. Some minor streets are close to traffic. Pedestrian pathways have been added with the new developments. All public paths have been upgraded with landscape, public art, fountains, water play features and furnishings. Portland instead heavily in its public domain of paths sideways and other open spaces which help draw many people to public spaces. Street tree planting has been priority for many years and as a result it gives a shaded attractive perspectives of trees along every walking streets. This kind of human public environment would be welcoming in any city. To enhance this public realm investment, heritage buildings have been restored throughout the inner city and dramatically changing the overall ambience and hospitality of the streetscapes. In 1970s, Harbour Drive was demolished and replaced with waterfront park extending along the shoreline, creating an attractive amenity for downtown workers and nearby res residents. Portland suburbs continue to sprawl, challenging the growth bounty. So far we have seen three case studies. Four major issues to be addressed in urban growth from the above case studies. Number one is adapting to climate change and limiting the global warming. And number two, balancing cars and other transportation in the form of transits. And number three, making cities and suburbs more livable and environmentally compatible. And the final one, designing and managing the public realm. Out of sight is out of mind. Knowing more about urban ecosystem helps to conserve it. Our today video session concluded. We need to do more research on eco-design for more healthier and happier and livable cities. Thank you.